never lose the wonder of this gospel mystery from the heavens came a savior from the ground arose a king every day is born
in your son Jesus the mighty name of Jesus the resurrection power we experience even today we thank you Lord because you were the word at the beginning and one where God the Lord most high in your hidden glory and creation Beautiful name. 
here in this place with us, God, and we celebrate that, your powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome. Happy Easter, everyone. It is so good to be here with you. If you are online for the very first time, please let us know, no matter when you watch this, let us know I'm new in the comments section. We would be happy to connect with you throughout the week. If you are in the house and this is your first time here, we wanna say a special welcome to you. And if you haven't already, stop by after service and get a gift. We love Easter around here. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Chris, what is your favorite thing about Easter? Okay, so first of all, Easter is by far my favorite day out of the year. And it's not even close because so many days bring hardship and, and uh, so many uh, bad things that can happen. But today is a day of hope. That's what today is. And my favorite part about Easter is seeing it in everybody's faces. It's one of the days out of the year I get to strap on a guitar and play music with some great musicians and even better friends and get to sing along with you guys. It's just, it, it's very rich in hope and joy. That's what I love about it. Chris, that's really close to my favorite thing as well. My favorite thing is you notice when you came in, we went to complete and total darkness. And during the song, we came to light. And it is just my yearly reminder that each of us have something that is in us that needs to die for us and for God to resurrect something new in us. And that is just a hope giving reminder. Uh, there's so many things we want you to be a part of after service. Uh, when, you're, when you're done here, please go on the crossing, hang out. Uh, there are photo stations, there are ways to get connected, thinking about your next step, so please just be here with us. And the next week, we invite you to come back, bring a friend, because we know that uh, churches and Christians can sometimes say some things uh, that are a little off Pudding. And so we want you to come back next week because together you and I are going to debunk some things that Christians and churches say. Check it out.
We hope you join us next week. We can't wait. And uh, she already mentioned, I just want to make sure if you are here for the first time, if you do nothing else, please stop by. We got a number of places out in the crossing for you to, to say hello. We'd love to meet you. And we have a gift for you. Just, just want to say hi. That's really it. There's a number of places to do that. So please stick around and do that if you can. We're moving into a time of offering. And for that, if you haven't already done so, download our app and that will help you with offering. It'll help you with sermon notes. It'll help you with things during the week. Uh, but as we move into time of offering, if there are a number of you in the house that have never been in church before, it's been a long time, and you hear that word offering, and you're not sure about it, or you, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that, here's what I want you to know. If, if, if you're new here, all offering is this. It's taking something of what you've got, whatever that may be, time, money, energy, whatever it is, and offering it to provide hope for somebody else. If, if you're in a waiting room and all the chairs are, are taken and you're sitting down and somebody comes in and you stand up and you offer them your chair, that's offering. When you hold the door open for a mom carrying in six kids on a stroller, that's offering. You are doing those little things to provide just a little bit of hope in somebody else's life. And today is the day that we celebrate the birth of that hope, the reason why we offer, because we look back at what Jesus did and we are compelled to do the same thing, to offer ourselves to others, to provide just a little bit of hope in their world. So that's what offering is about. So I would invite everybody in whatever way that you can, today of all days, let's all participate in worship through offering.
may be seated. Wow, I mean, what a morning already. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here, coming spattered all over the building. I know, I know you are. Uh, let me introduce myself right off the bat, just in case we've not met. Uh, my name is Rick. I am one of the pastors on staff here. Uh, I am a husband. I am a dad. I am a papa. I have one wife. That's all I can handle. Her name is Dallas. I have three amazing sons that I just love and respect so much, and three daughter-in-laws that I love more than my own life myself. And then I've got three grandchildren and one grandchild on the way, and I'm praying two more ex into existence whether they want to come or not. <laughs> you know, I, they, they, they don't know it, but it's, it's going to happen. I've just decided it, it, it's going to be. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, but primarily uh, I'm, I'm just Rick. And I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's really all I am. And it is an honor that we get to be here with you here uh, this morning. All, and all of the buildings, so many different places. Now, there's an Easter tradition where we, uh, someone will say Christ is risen. And everybody that's in the house, whether you're in the sanctuary, or you're in the crossing, whatever, you're online, everybody says he is risen indeed. So we're going to do that in just a second. But first of all, I want to say something to all the folks that are new. Regardless where you are, online or on the campus somewhere. Uh, we know there's a lot of folks that are checking out church that are new, been long time, been gone and everything like that. Not even sure if you believe in God. And I want you to know you're welcome here. Especially those you're not even sure about this whole thing called Jesus and the resurrection and all that sort of thing. You're really welcome here. And I want you to feel very comfortable not singing. Feel comfortable not saying any words. Feel, feel comfortable just sitting back and being a spectator all morning long. You feel comfortable. Just do what you got to do to endure this morning so when you get home, you can enjoy the family meal. You can enjoy the Easter egg hunt, the last round of the Masters and a nap without somebody saying, you should have gone to church, you should have gone. Just sit back and do what you got to do so you can put all this out, okay? But if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask you to respond. Because I'm going to say Christ is risen, and you're going to say Christ is risen indeed. Wherever you are in the building, wherever you are online, we're all going to do this together. Are you ready? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Let's do it one more time. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Yes, he is. Uh, we are one church with four different worship services. And yet we have people right now worse with us all over the world online. So I want to look in the camera and say hello to a few folks. I want to say to Bob and hello to Bob in Pennsylvania, Sue in Iowa, Gloria uh, in North Carolina, Ashley in St. Louis, uh, Cindy, your whole family in Houston, uh, to the Bennett family who lives over there in Georgia, to the Latham who live in their RV, who travel all around the United States, and Adina in New York who's going to be here in May. Uh, we just celebrate that we get to be with you. We just thank you for joining us online. If you're in the house or on campus somewhere and you're from out of town and you're in town for this weekend and you cannot find the church home, we would love for you to join all those who works with us all online every weekend from all spots of the world. And i got to say a special thank you to those out there in the crossing uh, that wasn't a seat for you and those that are in, in the center and those that are in the sanctuary, especially a word to you. I hope you are enjoying the, uh, the wonderful uh, Sunday Easter brunch we have with you, all the, the filet mignons and the salmon and the lobster and the cheeses and the fruits from all over the world, I hope you're really enjoying all of that. I really, really do. And it's just for you, okay? It's for nobody else. Uh, now, we're really not doing that. I just wanted y'all in the center to feel jealous of them uh, for a little bit and to express gratitude for all those out there that are doing that. You know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is Easter. And this is the weekend that followers of Jesus celebrate that God raised Jesus from the dead. And so this is a good time to talk about hope. Hope is something every single one of us have to have. You can't live without it. In fact, if you're taking notes, I would say it this way. It goes like this in your notes. I need hope like I need oxygen. I mean, you just can't live without it. And the truth of the matter is we all, when we're growing up, when we're young, we kind of hope recreationally. 
We say things like this, you know, I, I hope I pass that test. We say, oh, I hope I make the team. We say, oh, I hope we win the game. I hope I get the job. Maybe at some point you even, even thought, you know, I hope she says yes when I ask her out. Maybe you said, well, I hope he asks me out, or I hope he doesn't ask me out. You know? <laughs> or maybe if you're single, you got to point, man, I hope I get married. And then maybe you get married and you say, well, well, I hope we have kids. And if you ever get to that point where you're married and you have kids, I promise you, eventually you will say, I hope the kids leave. <laughs> I mean, I just hope they'll get out of here. I mean, I hope, I hope they'll get out of town, right? I mean, that's just the way it works. And, but, but, but if you live long enough, and I hope you do, but if you live long enough, eventually you will say, number two in your notes, you will know, groundless optimism will eventually disappoint me. Groundless hope will disappoint you. Life, people will disappoint you. Let's say you, maybe you don't get married when you thought you were going to. And then you do. And your marriage doesn't turn out like you hoped. You hope you're going to have kids and then you do. And then something happens to one of those kids, and you can't change it. Or something happens to you, horrific and terrible, and it has, and you begin to ask this question, is there a hope beneath all other hopes? Is there an ultimate hope that is so big, a hope that I can stand on when the ground beneath my feet begins to shake? shake. Is there a hope that stares death, that stares divorce, that stares depression, that stares addiction, that stares tragedy right in the face and never blinks? And Jesus says there is. He says there is a hope that is precisely when you feel like your life is at its darkest moment that God is getting ready to do the brightest thing you cannot even imagine in your life. He says it like this in John uh, chapter 12, verse 24. He says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now this is strange and a little bit haunting teaching if you really look at the text. And Jesus is explaining something that anybody who hears it and gets it has a decision they have to make in response to it. Let's start at the very physical level. And I want you to imagine you're the seed that Jesus is talking about in this text. You're the seed. And somebody digs a hole and they throw you into that hole. And then someone gets a shovel and they start shoveling dirt on top of you and all on top of you. And your first thought, if you're a seed, if you're that seed and you could think, you would think, whoa, I can't breathe. There's no air. There's no light. There's no sun. I can't move. I can't even, oh, this is the worst thing ever. This is the end. But then something happens, and this something happens, it happens all the time, and it happens so much that you and I forget that it's a miracle. It's a miracle every time it happens, but it happens so often that you and I just don't even acknowledge it, that something happens in the side of that little sea, it speaks out from above. We don't know who, some of you, but I know who, and it says, rise up. And all of a sudden, within that little seed, a, a little sprout rises up toward the sun, seeking and looking for light. And a little root goes down into the earth, looking for life and nourishment. Because you see, that seed has not been buried. It has been planted. Rise up. Rise up. 
There's a big difference between being buried and being planted. There are stories about this throughout the Bible where God does this. And some of you, just, you've read the Bible and some of you have not. So let me kind of give you a little couple of stories to kind of keep you see how God does this at the scriptures. There's a group of people in the Old Testament called uh, the, the Hebrew nation, the Jewish people. And one time they found themselves out in the wilderness, in the desert, wandering around for 40 years. They had been delivered from slavery. They had asked God to do it. And so God did it. And they're out there in the middle. And but all of a sudden they realize they're about to die because they have no food. They have no water. And they think, gosh, we might as well Go back and be slaves. We're going to die. We're going to be buried out here. But God was about to plant them in the promised land and to raise them up to give hope to the entire world. But they didn't realize it. They felt buried. There was a bright, strong young man named Joseph who found himself buried in a prison of a Pharaoh for a crime he did not commit. Injustice. And he thought it was the end. He thought he had been buried. But God raised him up to a level to be almost a cause of prime minister to save a whole lot of people from a famine in his own nation as well. A strong young boy finds himself out in the area facing a giant named Goliath. We all know what it's like to face giants. And we all know what it's like for a giant in our life to be so big that we say, you just might as well bury me now. Anybody ever thought that? You just might as well bury me now. I can't, I can't get through this. And yet that young boy had no idea what God was about to do to raise him up. A young woman named Esther, a Jewish woman who was married to a pagan king, a Gentile. He did not know it. And when he found out, she knew she was going to be killed. She was going to be destroyed. She was going to be buried. But she had no idea that God had not buried her, but had planted her in that specific place for the purpose of such a time as this to raise her up, to give hope to a whole lot of people. See, there's one sort of thing you really need to understand. There's a difference between being buried and being planted, and yet they look the same and they feel the same. They feel the same. But you got to know, when you feel like you're being buried, that is when God is getting ready to do the biggest, most unimaginable thing in your life that you cannot even fathom. Dallas and I had some neighbor friends, some people in this church that we loved and knew really well that couldn't get pregnant. They couldn't have kids, and they wouldn't have kids so bad if they, they wanted to. And so we told them we'd pray for them. So we started praying for them and praying and praying and praying and praying. And eventually they came to us and said, man, you're never going to believe it. Oh, we're praying that we're going to have a baby. They were so excited. We said, well, we'll continue to pray for you. They came back again, and they told us, hey, listen, you're not going to believe it. This is, we're going to have twins. I said, we'll really pray for you now. And they came back just two or three days later, and they said, whoa, you're not going to believe this. We're not having twins. We're having triplets. They said, stop praying. <laughs> see, see, it wasn't that their dream had been buried. Their dream had just been planted. That's it. It's not gone. See, we all love springtime. I think we all love Easter. Even if you're not a, a believer in Christ, I want to get emphasize, you're welcome here, you're welcome. But we all love the springtime. We love it when all of a sudden the dark, the, the dead grass starts kind of turning to green. We love it when the things we planted started to shoot up and we see the flowers begin to grow. We just love that. You love it to wake up in the morning and the sun's beginning to come up and it's about 65 between 70 degrees and no wind. And you think, man, this is just perfect. And you have this feeling that comes over you. The sense of positive attitude and hope and optimism. And you think, you know what? If I could just have a positive mindset and a positive attitude all the time, like it feels in springtime, I could just draw good things to myself all life. In other words, the glass of life is not half empty. It's not even half full. It is not big enough to contain everything that God wants to do. And if I could only have that attitude... But that's not what Jesus is saying. 
I believe in that, but there's not, that's not the same thing. Jesus is saying, explaining something very, very important. Remind you what he says. He says, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, he's talking about himself. He's going to Jerusalem to die. He's the seed. And he's going to die on the cross, and he knows it. He chooses to die on a cross. He willingly goes to die on a cross. Because he believes if he dies on a cross, there's going to be a power that's going to be unleashed that will never be unleashed. There's going to be a story that will be told that will never be told. I don't know what you believe about Jesus. Maybe you don't believe in him. I get it. It's okay. Maybe you don't believe in the miracles. You don't believe in the supernatural. You don't believe in this thing called eternity. But regardless of what you believe about him, you have to agree that this story about Jesus changed a whole lot of things, beginning with the cross. Right now, when you travel the world, there is no grave marked by more symbol than, than the symbol of the cross than any other symbol. More you travel the world, you will see graves just sprinkled all over every cemetery, the cross. And yet a cross was a symbol of execution, capital punishment, a symbol of killing people and suffering, embarrassing, and humiliation. You cannot go to a cemetery and find a symbol of a guillotine or a noose or an electric chair. You cannot find it. And if you found it, you would be aghast. So why is it you travel the world now and you see crosses and you put them almost every grave that we see because of Jesus? Because God raised him from the dead. That is why. And he did. He died on a cross. He took the cross that they used to end his life to start something brand new, to show the world. He decided to use this cross to show people how much God loves them, to show them the power of forgiveness, to show them the power of real love. He hung on a cross and they mocked him, but he didn't mock them back. They, he hung on a cross and they insulted him. He didn't insult them back. They hung him on a cross and he suffered. He didn't hate them back. And from that cross, Jesus, he embraced the in, unembraceable and he spoke words of truth in the face of those that were in power. And the people that were in power couldn't handle the kind of power that Jesus had. And so they said, we're going to put him on a cross and we're going to kill him. And they did. And they buried him. And after they buried him, they shook their hands like this and said, man, finally, we got rid of that guy. It is done. We will not deal with him ever again. But they were wrong. Because something spoke deep within that grave. Rise up. Rise up, rise up, and he rose up because he wasn't buried, he was planted. And I feel like I might be here in the presence of the frozen chosen, so let me help you a little bit. If you have never, ever, ever said amen in a worship service or never said amen on Easter, now would be the right time. And I'm going to tell you again, Jesus was not buried in that tomb, he was planted in that tomb, and all God's people said, amen, amen. because he was resurrected. He is alive. Number three, the resurrection of Jesus is your ultimate hope. It is a fact. I'll give you a little fact. If Jesus had not been resurrected, you would have no idea who he was. There were hundreds of people executed on crosses. Hundreds. You can't tell me the name of one of them. You don't know the name of a single one except one. And his name is Jesus. And I would argue that the name of Jesus is the most popular known name in the world. 
I'm going to put some faces up here on the screen. Whether you're in the crossing or you're in the sanctuary, I want you to shout out as well, okay? We're going to put, who, so tell me, who is this? Next, who is this? Next one. Next one. The Rock. Next one. Willie. I'll make you a promise. You can go somewhere in the world and put those faces up there, and there'll be one of them that somebody doesn't know. But there's no place in the world you can go where someone has not least heard of the name of Jesus. Why? Because he was resurrected from the dead. That is why. There's no other way to explain. According to their own account, these disciples, fishermen and tax collectors who were following this guy Jesus, before he was executed on the cross, were scared to death. And then right after the resurrection, they were brave enough and courageous enough to be willing to die for him. There's no other way to explain it. Before the resurrection of Jesus, nothing existed called the church. One day the church did not exist. The next day the church did exist. And not only exist, but out of the church have come women and men who have been called to rise up and build more hospitals, more colleges and universities, more health clinics, more aid to the poor and under-resourced countries. I could go on and on, more paintings, more music than any institution in the world because of the resurrection of a man named Jesus. You and I live at this intersection of hope and despair. And here's the critical thing I want you to grab hold of in your notes here uh, this evening, this, this morning. And that is number four. The resurrection of Jesus means my worst thing it's not the last thing. The last thing, the last thing, the last thing, I don't know whatever, the most painful, worst thing, worst thing is in your life. The worst possible thing you can imagine. You think of it right now. You imagine what I might be. But when that worst thing happens, it is not the last thing. And you got to hang on to that truth and that hope that we have in Jesus. He says, listen, if a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many fruit. And he goes on, anyone who loves their life will lose it. You make sure you understand what he is not saying here. He is not saying to hate your life. Love your life. Life is a gift. Jesus loved his life. He loved life. And I want you to love your life. and love, It's a gift. It's a wonderful thing that God has given to you. Here's what he is saying. He said, if I, if I live for myself, if I live for everything to go my way, if I make everything about me, what I want, what I need, what I think, if I live like everybody else, like the world and culture, to just climb the corporate ladder, to climb the ladder of success as high as I can go, be as successful as I can, be as comfortable as I can. If that is the main call in my life, your seed will be barren and empty and fruitless. That's what he's saying. So what do I do? I love the way little kid in Sunday school say, kids have a way of I'm getting through all the clicks chaff and just get to the point. The Sunday teacher is trying to teach these kids about Jesus and about, about grace and love and God and eternity. And so she said, hey, let me tell you, kids, can, can you go into heaven by doing all these good deeds? They said, no. Can you get into heaven by going to church enough? They said, no. Can you go to heaven by giving enough money? They said, no. She said, well, well how do you get to heaven? One kid said, well, you got to die. Out of the mouth of a child. In your notes, number five, the way to a hope-filled life is through death to self. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, anybody who loves their life, you will lose it. you got to die to self. i got to die to my ego. i got to die to my agenda. i got to die to my pride. i got to die to my sin. 
I got to die to my will and say, God, not my will, your will be done in me and around me. And I surrender my life to your will. And when you do that, you begin to experience the new you, a greater life, a greater self, a more nobler self. And I want to show you what this looks like. I want you to meet here on the screens, wherever you are in the crossing, out there in the sanctuary, please find a screen where you can see the image, this little video here, and meet Katrina Castleberg, Aaron's Castleberg. In order to hear God, you have to be quiet. In order to feel God, you have to be still. And I was not. My parents had a terrible relationship. Don't recall it ever being good. My father was an atheist, never went to church, never spoke about church. My mother had gone to Catholic school. According to her, was just so traumatized by all of it that she just never wanted to go back to church. We never spoke about God in my house, and I don't recall ever even having a religious conversation at all in my house. I wasn't happy, and I used to wonder why everybody else seemed happier or luckier than me. I joined the Dallas Police Department in 1999, and I got married several years later to Lauren. We eventually got pregnant with our first child, and Lauren was adamant that we find a church home. He did not want our children to be raised without God. We decided to try Pathway on one Christmas Eve, and he really liked it. So we came back and we eventually joined the church. So in 2016, Lauren was working a protest in Dallas. We're learning new details about the sniper ambush of police officers in downtown Dallas last night. Five officers killed and six others hurt in Dallas, Texas. At 3.35 a.m., officials confirm the standoff is over. Just after four in the morning, President Obama, traveling overseas, speaks from Warsaw. By sunrise this morning, officials raise the tragic toll. Twelve officers shot, five dead. This is the deadliest attack on U.S. law enforcement since 9-11. This unforgettable image, police officers at Baylor Medical Center saluting the victims in blue. Of course I'm, I'm thankful that my babies are okay. Mm. But somebody's dad, this is my husband, is it? Officer Michael Kroll, Senior Corporal Lauren Ahrens, and Officer Patrick Zamaripa were killed. Shots fired, officer down, it's an assist officer. Katrina and Lauren were the ultimate partners. A team dedicated to each other, partners balancing two police careers, but most importantly, partners raising two wonderful children. got to tell Lauren's kids that he's not coming home. It was very overwhelming for my kids. That was the hardest part. Lauren was a excellent father and my kids were very attached to him. They were old enough to understand but definitely not old enough to be able to process it. My job was to support my kids the best way I could and that was really my only focus. As I was sitting in the hospital, something just told me, and it was very clear, and it was very instant, almost like somebody was in front of me saying it, that it was gonna be okay, that I was going to be okay through this, and just do what you need to do, and everything is gonna be all right. At that point, I didn't have enough time to really think about what that meant, and where that came from, and the significance of it at that second. But I remember knowing it and I remember feeling it right then. And I knew that that was God, that that was him embracing me in that moment. My life as I knew it was dead. It was gone. 
but God told me it was going to be okay. That allowed me to have hope, knowing that God has a plan for me going forward, and He's walking with me through all of it. That's been with me to this day. I was so lucky that I heard God, I felt God, and that I was in a place where I was able to receive it and understand what it was. Because God's been with me the whole time. He's been with me since I was young. I didn't know that. I didn't know that I was being walked with and supported. And everything that I had gone through as a child and an adult was preparing me to be able to successfully navigate what I was going through. If I hadn't have had that attitude that came from knowing that I was supported by God, I would not have been able to go forward with any sort of positivity. Ultimately, that led me to be able to meet and receive who is now my new husband, Tony. I met Tony after Lauren died and connected with him immediately. The more I saw him and got to know him, it felt like we'd known each other forever. If I had been stuck in my grief, if I had been stuck in these bad things happened to me, then I wouldn't have been open enough to see him. I wouldn't have been positive enough to where maybe he even wanted to interact with me. But if I hadn't have felt a sense of peace, there's no way I would have had room to feel that connection at all. I started getting the tug to go back to church. For a while I didn't come because I just didn't want to come without Lauren. It just didn't feel right. I started bringing Tony to church. He did not have a church home. And the first day that we walked in, you looked at both of us and smiled. And it was a big deal. We didn't feel any judgment at all. And he felt very welcome. And he has been coming ever since. He loves it here. We eventually got married. And as I still navigate through a lot of things with Lauren's death, he has been there every step of the way. He has been more than what I deserve. He has not been a stepdad. He has been a dad that stepped up. He took on a lot, and that just shows his character. It shows that God chose the exact right person for me. And we consider ourselves blessed by God. My life is so much different now than it was. I never thought I'd be here. If you had told me even two years ago, seven years ago, that I'd be here at this church doing any of the things I'm doing, I would have told you you're a lunatic. And if any one of those things hadn't happened, if any one of those things hadn't affected me the way they did, if any of those people hadn't been placed in my life at the time that they had been placed, if any one of those things hadn't happened, and if I hadn't have received it with such a willing spirit, I wouldn't be here now with such a strong faith and such a desire to continue helping other people find theirs. Can you join me in celebrating what God has done? It's just an amazing story, amazing story, an amazing, amazing story. Let me tell you what, at your darkest moment, it's just amazing the healing, the resurrection that God can do. And what happened to Katrina has happened to thousands of people, and it can happen to you. You can belong to Jesus. You can hear that voice speak to you, rise up. You can. You can experience new life. You can. You can take another step in that relationship and experience all the things that she experienced and more. You can be baptized. In fact, you're on the weekend of Mother's Day weekend. We're going to have a big baptism party. And we're going to invite everyone who has rededicated their life to Christ or who is ready to get baptized to show up on that weekend, invite their family and friends, and, and kind of we'll have a great big celebration party. And so if this is you, you can learn about that by out there in the crossing. Whether you're in the sanctuary, you're in the crossing right now, we got a next steps area. You can go and say, listen, I think I'd want to be baptized, and I'm going to be standing right there by that. I would love to meet you and connect you, and you can be a part of that if you're ready, ready to do that. But you need to make, to, make sure you understand this. You have to die first. You got to get planted. And wherever can you hear my voice, online, anywhere on campus or in the house, I want to give you a chance to do that right now before you walk out the doors, and you're about to do that. If you're ready, you've been putting it off, you're ready. What a great day on Easter 2023.
So I'm going to, out of respect for everybody who's going to do this, I'll invite everyone, please, to close their eyes. Everyone, wherever you are on site, everywhere on campus, in the crossing, uh, in the sanctuary, online, right here in the house, to close your eyes, bow your head. And if you are ready, if you are ready to experience new life, or you are ready uh, to have a relationship with Jesus, if you are ready to get reconnected with the dreams and hopes that God had for your life since your birth, if you're ready to die to yourself and to be alive in Him, just pray right there silently in your heart, wherever you are. God, I confess there is stuff inside of me. Stuff I do not want and stuff I do not like. Stuff I cannot control. Anger. Bitterness. Hatred. Resentment. Greed. Lust. Revenge. A seek desire to be in control of everything and everyone just to be in control to be right addictions regret guilt shame failure so God in this moment I'm laying all that is in me down and I'm naming it I'm repenting of it and I'm asking for your help I'm asking for you, God, to do in me what you did for Jesus and through Jesus to cleanse me, to forgive me, to give me a new beginning and a fresh start and to call me to rise up and be my leader from this day forward. I'm asking you to do that. Still, wherever you are on campus, eyes closed, head bowed, if you prayed that prayer in any fashion in your heart, would you please, just as a symbol and a sign of I'm all in, would you please just raise your hand in the center, in the sanctuary, and in the crossing, just raise your hand if this is you. If you are ready, you're tired, you are weary, just raise your hand. Yes. I invite you to lower them down. I just want to pray over you just for a second. God, I pray for everybody online in this room. For everyone who has prayed this prayer, God, who surrendered their life to you, to help them, God, get connected to the right person. To grow in grace, to grow in strength, to grow in salvation, to heal and move forward with their life. And God, I pray for everybody on campus, in this room, online, who can hear my whole voice, who feels buried. Who feels buried by life who feels buried by their job, who feels buried by pain, who feels buried by anger, by resentment, by their past, by their broken family, by anything in their life, God, that you would plant within the name of Jesus, deep within them, and they would hear him say, rise up, rise up, rise up, because if you see what I see, and you know what I know, the grave is empty. You know that anything is possible with me. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Cause if you see what I see, let's do this, let's sing it one more time. The grave is empty.
there in the house, if you have made a decision this morning to get baptized, I'm going to be at Next Steps. I would love to meet you and get you connected. First timers, take that gift home. Happy Easter, everybody. He is risen.